is Good morning, everyone. My name is Jill Johnson, and I'm the executive director for Isquals, and we are pleased to have you all join us for um, our fourth Isquals webinar. And it is titled, What Do Intentional Communities Have to Do with Quality of Life? A talk connecting the dots between the human brain, happiness, and how we choose to live together. Um, so we'll go ahead and introduce um, all of us, the ones that are facilitating. Um, if you want to scroll to the next slide, there we go. Uh, Laura Muzikanski, she is the executive director for the Happiness Alliance at happycounts.org, and she'll be uh, moderating and facilitating. Uh, Bjorn Grinde, who is going to be our guest speaker, you can see he's the he has a PhD. He's the chief scientist at uh, Division of Mental and Physical Health uh, at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, and a researcher and an author. So we're very pleased to have you with us, Bjorn. And again. Thank you. Jill. Um, so just a couple of uh, housekeeping items before we get started. Um, some of you have joined us before, but take your mouse cur cursor and if you go to the very bottom of the screen, you'll see a little uh, menu that pops up and there is a little chat button there. If you want to click that, um, that will enable you to type any messages. You, they've also now allowed for if you have a question, you can raise your hand. Um, you can ask for this speaker to go slower or faster. Um, make sure that you stay muted during the um, presentation. We will have a time for question and answers at the end. So if something comes up and you have a question immediately, feel free to type that in and then we'll address that at the end of the webinar. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Laura and uh, she will introduce our speaker a little bit more. Great, thank you, Jill. So this is the last of the 2017 ISQUALS webinars and we will be continuing this in 2018 and we're lining people up. Um, and, and I'll say this now and probably at the end, if you have somebody you would like to um, be see um, a webinar focused on or if you would like to have something on you, um, please let Jill and myself know. The intent of these webinars is to uh, look at some different perspectives and, and bring in um, some people who we might not know are doing really fabulous work. And I met Bjorn at the 2017 ISQALS conference. Uh, and when I met him and then when also I read about him, it was very exciting to me because he's doing something that I just really admire and love is looking at the intercepts between various different fields. So he's looking at the the, the nexus, the interconnections between biology, quality of life, and now human consciousness. So as Jill mentioned, he's the chief scientist at, at the, for the Division of Mental and Physical Health at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. He's also an author, a filmmaker, an app developer, a TED talker. <laughs> So he has a wide variety of things that he's done, and I'm going to finish by just saying a couple of the titles of his books. Um, the Biology of Happiness is one, The Evolution of Human Consciousness is another one, and then he's got lots of others, but the last one I'll mention is Darwinian Happiness, The ev Evolution as a Guide for Living and Understanding Human Behavior. Uh, he'll talk about his website, but I suggest you go to grinde.wikispaces.com and learn more. This is fascinating. So really, really pleased to have you here, Bjorn. Really honored. And I'll turn it over to you. So. Well, thank you, Laura and Jill. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about what happiness is. I, I'm a biologist, as you mentioned, and uh, I'm probably the only biologist studying happiness. But I think biology has the, uh, an advantage in helping us understand what happiness really is in the brain. So I'm, I'm start, I'll start by presenting a model of that. Uh, you have the first slide for me, please. Oh, this, yeah, the opening slide. So then in my work, working on mental health, or which is for me about the same term as happiness, uh, I'm, engaged in finding out how to improve happiness in the population of Norway or internationally. But the, uh, the uh, so I work as what I would refer to as a human behavioral biologist. Uh, next one, please. The, for me, the purpose of using evolutionary perspective on this is that evolution helps us kind of put the pieces or the puzzles in places 
And this is this works regardless of what sort of organism or whether it's a biosphere or just a human organ like the human brain you're looking at. By seeing things in light of evolution, it helps you understand what this organ or what this species is all about. So next one. So the, the first question I'd like to ask is, who can be happy? Uh, and I start with a rose here because it looks very nice, but does it have happiness? And I know quite a few people would say, yes, it can be happy, it looks happy. Uh, I said, no, sorry, it doesn't have a nervous system and a nervous system is required for any organism to be happy. Um, on the second picture is a small round worm or a nematode, a tiny animal. And that actually do have a nervous system, but only with some 300 nervous cells in it. And I'm sure that is not sufficient to be happy. So it requires a nervous system. It, it also requires certain aspects, certain qualities of that nervous system. And of course, the third one, you know, has the potential of being happy. So next one, please. So the second question I asked then is, why do actually animals are equipped with nervous systems? And the easy answer is that nervous systems are there to direct behavior. And behavior means movement. Basically, any plant doesn't need to move around because it gathers its energy from the sun and the sun will always shine from above. But animals need to find their food and potentially avoid uh, predators or other harsh environments. So the evolution designed this kind of nervous system and it's a basic recipe for nervous system is the same in all animals. It has a sensory cells that kind of tells the animal something about environment. It has a processing unit like the human brain and it has the effector cells that can direct the muscles and then it, that again causes the action, the movement. Our next one. So why does an organism need to move? It's, it's, it's actually just two simple reasons why any animal should move around. It is to move away from whatever is bad for the genes and toward what is good for the genes. So this is a nematode, it kind of stopped moving. I hope it would move a little bit more, but it's not really, oh, it's got a tired probably. So yeah, well, we'll just go on to the next slide. So what evolution installed in other the distant forefathers was to use feelings as a strategy for making these behavioral decisions as to when to move forward, when to approach something that's good for the genes, and when to avoid what is bad for the genes. And actually our prospect of happiness is just an accidental byproduct because to move us away from something bad, we have to feel bad about it. And to move us toward what is good, we have the feeling that is pleasant. So all the brain needs to do is kind of calculate what is the, what is the, uh, the, the sum of the pot potential good and bad feelings that can derive from whatever we choose to do and then act accordingly. Okay, next one. So there's, based on various uh, reasons, we can assume that, these, that the, the uh, feelings evolved in the early amniotes, that's the the, uh, the ancestors that uh, share have a, that led to mammals and reptiles and birds. And that's kind of uh, somewhat controversial conjecture, but if it is correct, it means, means that these animals have the capacity to feel and possibly only these animals have the capacity to be conscious as well, because feelings may be the main reason why we did evolve consciousness. Okay, next one. Uh, the, the brain has lots of functions in it and they're all kind of put into the, the nervous system by the evolutionary process over several hundred million years. So in a way it's like the apps on the smartphone, each function is like an app that can be switched on when needed or switched off and no longer needed. And uh, the point though here though is that these, the feelings are can be viewed as just a set of apps that control the good and bad feelings we have, but in general, they are controlled by the unconscious brain because it's important for the genes to, or they are there to control your behavior. You're not set up to control what you feel simply because if you then chose to not heed the 
the, the pain warning, you might just destroy yourself. Okay. So the what mood or happiness or well-being can be defined as simply the net activity of these mood or, or feelings apps. That is adding the rewards and subtracting the punishments that the brain gives us. And looking at happiness just as kind of the activity of these uh, apps or functions in the brain also kind of brings us towards a way of uh, or an approach to how to improve happiness in the population. Uh, next one. Um, first, the, the, uh, the, uh, I, I think the brain is set to be happy or have a default state of contentment simply because if it is in a good mood it's better for the genes because then you're more likely to take the trouble of going out and finding a uh, food or finding a partner. So if everything is okay, you should be happy. That is the reward apps normally should dominate in your brain. Unfortunately, that is not always the case. And the next one. And the problem is that we have these punishment apps and they are, they are uh, functions meant to save your life in occasions. They are uh, defense functions. And as it's much more important to react immediately if you see a danger, like if you think you saw a snake on the ground, and if you happen to pass by an apple, if you don't react to the snake, it might kill you. While if you pass by the apple, it doesn't really matter. So these uh, punishment apps are very easily triggered. And that also means they easily get hyperactive. They easily get uh, exercised to the, to the effect that they are turning themselves on even when they're not needed. And there are three kind of main types of these punishment apps. They are just the normal pain, like from falling and hitting your knees. It's fair and it's low mood. And when these are hyperactive, the psychologists will refer to that as either chronic pain or anxiety or depression. And that is what tend to happen in the population today, that these apps tend to be hyperactive. Okay. So the, uh, there's two approaches as to how to improve the situation. And one is to kind of look at the way we are living. And the point here is that we humans were shaped to what we may refer to as the Stone Age way of life in this version one zero here on this, this cartoon. And then we kind of, then culturally we kept on evolving or the culture changed to what is here depicted as a 2120 version where it's not quite as well in some respects as the 10 versions. We got what we refer to as the diseases of civilization. And of course the point then is to further change the culture to have improved cultural adaptation to the 30 version of humans. And then doing so can be either by changing the way we live or by just finding ways to exercise the brain so that we can improve happiness again. The next one. So in one project I have kind of aimed in this direction is looking at the ways we can live, the ways people do live. And of course, ideally as a biologist, I would like to do experiments on humans and to divide all the humans in two groups and say one should live like this and the other one like that. But it's neither practical nor ethical to do so. So instead we have to rely on experiments that people do on themselves. And uh, I contacted the uh, uh, Movement for Intentional Communities, the Fellowship of Intentional Communities to help them, help us to do a project on these communities because in my mind, they kind of are a natural experiment that can help us find out something about how we should live. Our next one. Oh yeah, first, the, uh, as I said, it's, it's possible to, the, the human brain is very uh, adaptive. So we can, we can change it by either, by the way we live, but also by exercising it. So, and it's kind of like muscles that the more you activate a certain app or function in the brain, the more you will strengthen it, like in this case with the pictures of the biceps and the Norwegian ski star who has a very nice biceps. But in the case of the brain, it's uh, 
you don't really want to exercise all parts of the brain. You want to exercise the good mood, moods, and you also want to exercise the off buttons or the negative moods, the the excessive fear or the excessive uh, uh, the depression or the excessive pain. And the question then is if the life in intentional communities will help doing so. Uh, next one. The uh, first point then is that, the, uh, as I said, we live in a kind of human zoo or an age of, uh, of the diseases of civilization. And in my, uh, the way I describe it is to say that we have, there's lots of differences in the way we live today compared to the Stone Age. But most of these differences are just, or mismatches are just positive. It's, it's nice to have a good bed to sleep in. And it's nice to have uh, medicine to treat you from diseases. But some of these differences, maybe just a few of them, I refer to as discords because they are causing the diseases of civilization. So next one. And nearsightedness is a very good example of a disease of civilization because you find it in very high prevalence in cities, while hard at all in people living and traditionally like farmers in Nepal or tribal people in Africa. So we try to find out what is causing this. And I thought it could be either too much focus on close range, like when we read, or that, that we keep the light on at night, or that we tend to stay inside instead of spending time outside. And recently science found that the, actually, actually the answer to this is that we do not spend enough time outside simply by having the children spend an hour or two outside every day, they will, or the prevalence of nearsightedness will go down. Apparently because the eyes need the UV light from the sun to develop correctly. Next one. So then the question of course for me is to find out what sort of discords are causing the mental problems we have today. And uh, one kind of possible uh, answer is that it has to do with the social structure of human societies. As I mentioned, we have a kind of shape to live in a tribal society with a very few members, while we do live in very large scale societies with lots of strangers around us all the time. And we thought that might be a factor that could uh, impact on our happiness or on mental problems. So next one. So the intentional communities tend to be more like the tribal setting in my mind. They are small scale, they tend to be close knit, they are sharing in that they tend to have shared meals and maybe shared living quarters, and they have a purpose of life, that's why they are intentional, and they are normally non-hierarchical, hierarchical. they don't have any leaders or any strong leaders, they are more democratic in that way. And this, this, all these features is kind of what I expect the tribal situation was like if you go back like 10,000 years. Next one. So we did a kind of web-based questionnaire to probe whether people living in intentional communities would be different in aspects of having to do with happiness compared to people living in the outside society. So this was done in North America and we compared with similar uh, questionnaires that has been uh, performed with populations in the in the general population of the uh, North America, and we got some thousand responses from these communities, and probed like social relations, happiness, and their meaning of life, and lots of other uh, features of how they live. So next one, and just very briefly, the, the, this is published, and the, the reference is on the bottom there, but the we found that as far as life satisfaction goes, which is the main, uh, the, very, the most commonly used measure of happiness, they scored as, uh, as high as any other population score. I think the, other, the only other population scoring 5.41 or that high on that scale would be Norwegian pregnant mothers. That would be the top. And their score would tend to drop once they drop off the baby. So, but they also scored very highly on certain personality traits like emotional stability, they tend to be reasonably extrovert and open, etc. And they scored high on having social support, 
And another measure for that would be like either identity fusion, as they felt identity with their group, and they scored very high on having a meaning of life. And all these kind of factors kind of work together, saying that uh, they're, they're doing very well. I, I should mention this is a questionnaire study, and it's not uh, it's not rocket science. It has lots of of uh, possible uh, uh, mistakes or, or uh, cofactors in that can may attribute to these these numbers. But overall, I do think they do reflect that people in these communities are doing quite well, and I believe it's at least partly because they have chosen a lifestyle that is more in tune with what humans are and are designed to live. And of course, they did not think biology. They just did what they felt would be good for themselves in choosing to live in these communities. And I'm very happy to see that it seems to be working. Uh, next one. Oh yeah, that was the end of my talk. It's just some of my books and then the uh, reference to my my internet uh, uh, pages, where I do have links to these articles in case anyone is interested, and also links to other things I write or 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 make. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. So, um, so now we'll bring it to if people have questions. Um, you can unmute yourself, and for some reason, my. Uh, my screen has decided to just now black out, so apologies for that. Mm -hmm. So you can um, unmute yourself or you can ask questions in the chat. Um, and while we wait a minute, I'll just say, um, I noticed Bjorn that it seemed to me like um, in the intentional communities, those six factors that the World Happiness Report often ident or does identify as leading to a person's happiness and well-being seem to be in play or um, you know it, it seems like many of those factors are and um, the predominant one is the social support piece but um, they also talk about participation and uh, trust in government and it seems like in those communities they sort of have their own government and they also don't seem to have an issue with income or making ends meet in that way is that your experience or well, I think they have. They do tend to have an issue with income. They're not. They score low on uh, on total like uh, income compared to uh, the also society, and it's a problem because uh, it's they generally form places where it's not that easy to find jobs in the vicinity, and then again, and also these people may not be tuned towards getting rich primarily. They're more tuned to making a good life for themselves. So money is a problem for some of these communities, but in spite of that, they still are happy, which is kind of the positive way of looking at it. Well, that's interesting. Um, do we have other other questions? There is there is one question from uh, Orsolia. Yeah, I wrote it up on the board. Yeah. Sure. Hi. Go ahead. Hi. Or shall I say it as well? I could say. Sure. So you presented a table with your results, um, and, and if I understood well, these were averages from, from the intentional communities, from the respondents who answered. And I was just wondering how these results compare to the general population, um, and, and also whether you looked at the variation of, of results uh, within, across these intentional communities, whether there are certain type of, types of communities which work better than others, Oh, you sound. I could answer the first question. Her sound fell out for me after that. But uh, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Okay. Can you can you hear me? Yeah, I do. Yeah, the uh, the, I mean, we thought this. There's a very heterogeneous mix of communities that belong to the fellowship in intentional communities, which these are recruited from, and uh, we tried to kind of differentiate and see, but it was not enough really data for that. And also it's difficult because it's not kind of, it's not easy to, I mean, we could, we thought we could distinguish between religious communities, like it would be like for monasteries or just deeply religious people and to more uh, eco-minded communities or to more uh, ways of, or, or just sharing housing. But uh, there's all kind of gradient between these types of communities, which made it difficult to, to, to differentiate. Uh, so uh, I forgot what, what was your other question. 
that your table uh, was it kind of referring to the averages of the respondents from from these communities yes it's the average score for this whole whole set of people from i think we got uh, we got the answers from people belonging to a total of about or more than 100 different communities so mm -hmm. it's uh, quite diverse and uh, it's not it's not any one single obvious population we can compare with so compared with just other industrialized western populations that use this where they have used the same questionnaires to probe for data the, the details of course if you're interested in the science part is better read in the article because they're, they're also discussing various confounders that or may factors that may contribute to making this a skewed picture of reality but i kind of like communities i spend quite some time in different communities and my experience there is that they are Lots of people there who are very, uh, have very resourceful and are very clever at, at finding solutions. And there's also people who struggle to find ways of living in the normal society and who then come to communities. And I should also mention that, of course, the communities that we did get response from would be those who have been successful and have survived for quite some while. There are quite a few attempts of making communities that does not survive. So this is the kind of successful communities. And they, of course, have found ways of dealing with the problems that are do arise when you try to form a small scale community like that. And forming a small scale community within an industrialized nation is, of course, a lot more difficult than if you're born into a tribal community in Africa or somewhere. It's uh, it's so much easier if you're kind of formed that way and trying to reshape people into living that way. Mm -hmm. So I'm still kind of happy that the results were actually better than I expected they would be. Thank you. Um, we do have another question from Joe Sergi. Joe, if you wanted to read that question if you want me to read it if you <clears throat> can unmute yourself there you go um hello hi, hi. Lauren. Uh, this is joe um the question is um i read so much about uh, evolutionary theory and biology and of course the contributions from from these disciplines and 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 and, and they make good contributions um, but I haven't yet um, read anything about the distinction between hedonic well-being and eudaimonic well-being, and if, from a biological point of view, um, whether biologists and evolutionary uh, psychologists have gotten to a point where they can actually make that ex ex uh, distinction explicit. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yes, I do. Thank you. I, I have, and I've written about it in some of my books. The, uh, I think the field of happiness studies kind of moved forward since the Greek philosophers coined those two terms. And although they may be useful for some, some reasons, the, the point for me is that whether you get a positive feeling from eating chocolate or being with friends or doing anything else that is pleasant is the same kind of positive reward center that are activated in the brain. So the different, to differentiate between hedonic and eidamonic pleasures is not really, uh, wouldn't be the uh, way a biologist would describe this. What is an important point though, is that certain kind of pleasures are short-lived and quite a few types of pleasures, whether it's the chocolate or the alcohol or uh, excessive living in other ways, will tend to have backfire later and i think that's the point of the hedonic term that the uh, uh they tried to realize at some point in the ancient greek that if you drank too much and had too much wine and so on too much just singing and women that you would not eventually end up being happy later in life so they then try to make people choose values or ways of happiness or ways of activating the reward app in the brain that would lead to a more permanent type of happiness and of course friendship or meaning of life and so on which are the eidemonic values do function better in that respect but in my mind that should not uh, stop people from also enjoying the more hedonic happiness uh, uh, ways right 
Um, but from a, again, a biological perspective, uh, I, I guess from a, uh, from a brain structure, the brain reward center, one can explain hedonic well-being, uh, again, from a biological point of view. Uh, but I'm not sure whether from a biological point of view, one can explain eudaimonia. Well, can eudaimonia, you? I, I think I can. I think eudaimonia is the typical values that people that people uh, consider a demonic would be like I mean friendship or like having a meaning having long-term relationships and they all have biological reasons why they should activate the reward systems of the brain i mean we need we are we are a, a social species that need to collaborate with fellow humans and it's quite obvious that then doing so having being with friends or doing being collaborative or being passionate should uh, therefore activate the pleasure center, and it does so. Do so. We can show it does. It does activate pleasure center in the brain, and it's the same centers activated by the hedonic uh, happiness uh, factors. And the same thing with the meaning of life. I think humans were designed to. Um, I mean, evolution kind of gave us a reward if we try to do something that will. Uh, that is considered to um, improve or to further our existence. And therefore the meaning thing is a way to spur people to do whatever the genes consider would be forwarding their I mean, planning for the future or doing things that are good for them or for others. And that too should deserve a reward based on evolutionary reasoning as well, in my mind. So uh, it, it's not... Uh, it, it makes sense to me that the brain just uh, activated like, oh, there you are, I can see you now. <laughs> that brain just activated like, have, or just constructed a few uh, apps that do deliver both either the positive or the negative feelings. And then they connected that with whatever source of positive or negative feelings that would be reasonable to connect with the reward or the punishment. And the, so, Again, that would be whether the uh, factors would be typical hedonic or adamonic. It will still activate these same reward centers of the brain. Um, you see this book? Yeah, Loneliness. Yes. It's by John Cassiopeia, who is essentially a, uh, uh, a neuroscientist and also a, a social psychologist. This book is uh, really fascinating. It, it really talks about social well-being uh, from an evolutionary perspective. And, and he talks about, uh, you know, he makes the connections between uh, uh, happiness and kin selection and direct reciprocity and indirect reciprocity and network reciprocity and group selection and all of that from a uh, biological uh, evolutionary perspective. Um, but then he uh, he doesn't really address eudaimonia in the, in the way that some of us now are beginning to talk about it. Um, so again, I challenge uh, the biologist among us <laughs> to um, do a little bit more of that. Some of the recent uh, research on uh, on eudaimonia from a um, from a neuroscience perspective have looked at the, at the prefrontal cortex and they, um, and, and they uh, realize that there are different anatomical parts of the prefrontal uh, cortex that can elicit uh, hedonic well-being versus eudo eudomanic well-being. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see how this will unfold in the future to try and make that distinction much clearer. Uh, so I urge you to, uh, uh, to, to do a little bit more thinking in that direction and, and help us out. <laughs> okay, sir. thank you. The, for me, the, uh, just a small comment on loneliness because that is the, that's a negative feeling. And that's for me, uh, would be related to just depression, so low mood. And the point of low mood is to kind of help <laughs> to tell the individual that he should change his way of living in some way. He should either, if he's lonely, he should make friends because for the genes, that is the appropriate thing to do. If you fail on an, on an, on an exam or something, you should 
you really study harder because then you will pass the exam. So that's the purpose, there's a purpose to it, depression, but that again, that would activate the negative feelings. But again, it's the same negative feeling, whether you hurt your knee or break your arm or, or uh, flunk on an, on an exam or lose your friends. So the brain is kind yeah. of structured that way that it has a center for delivering negative feelings. Okay, right. thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. We have one more question from Michael Lennon. Michael, I don't know if you wanted to unmute yourself or if you wanted me to ask the question. Sure. Hi, I'm Mike Lennon. I can unmute myself. And um, I, although I asked the question, um, what do you think are some of the most toxic, unrecognized factors of 21st century living? I do have a couple of other questions of really trying to apply these ideas. I love the presentation, by the way. Well done. Beautiful. Really mind opening for me. Thank you. And, uh, and I really uh, admire what you're, uh, how you're, you're going, the direction you're going. And so thank you. And I'll, I'll have a follow up question. So what is the most toxic, I mean, the worst part of present living? Yeah, what are some of the unrecognized? You, you use the example of, of how nearsightedness is a byproduct of living indoors. Yeah. There, there may have been others, maybe, maybe toxic isn't the right word, most surprising discoveries for you of our habitual way of living that you think we need to be re-examining. Well, I think the, well, the, 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 basically anxiety and depression are the big, uh, or actually, in my mind, probably the worst cases of diseases of civilizations. They, they, they. I think about it. Counted some almost half the population during the lifetime has a diagnosable mental disorder, and anxiety and depressions are the more common ones. And I think for the the brain is flexible throughout the life, but it uh, develops most profoundly in the first years of life. And I think the way we handle children. Wow. Con to the high rate of depression. Uh, am I still on? Or can people hear me? I think someone doesn't realize they're not on mute. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, uh, Majid, if you could mute yourself for us. Thank you. Well, that's, that's fine. The, uh, the, uh, so, in anxiety is the easiest uh, um, problem to grasp, I think. It's the fear function being exercised too much. And the way in Western world that we deal with infants, we tend to put them in their own room or we tend to, we don't carry them anymore and we don't sleep together with them, which is what they do in tribal societies. And that uh, causes the infant to kind of, to, to activate the fear function in the infant. And I think that's one reason why we have such a high uh, proportion of people having problems with anxiety later in life. And that is something we can do some, we can deal with. We can kind of uh, advise mothers to carry the children more. We can advise parents to have the infant in bed with them for the first years till the infant feels safe. And I think that would help. And that's kind of, it's one of my pet kind of uh, points I like to make when talking about what I think would, could be changes in, in society. Thank you, fantastic. Um, and uh, then you might like the Harvard study that showed that uh, the talk predictor of success uh, was the warmth of the relationship with the mother. I don't know if you, you know, of economic success. I don't know if I'm over summarizing it. I'm over summarizing that, but are you familiar with what I'm talking about? I don't think, I haven't seen that, but there's lots of study kind of linking the uh, child, child environment with later mental issues. I, uh, easy to show with, with animals, you can easily see that if you do separate the child from the mother, they will develop symptoms like depression and anxiety. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this, but basically it's the longest study I understand on humans ever done so far. It's a 75 year study. And one of the findings that I found most surprising was that the top economic earners and the lowest economic earners, what, what the variable that most explained the difference in their economic, if you will, income was not their race or their uh, class or their level of education, but it was uh, the warmth of their relationship with their mother. And so it kind of aligns very nicely with what you're saying. But yeah. um, uh, so I'll, I'll share that separately. I don't mean to usurp 
uh, the conversation, but I do have another question that I wanted to ask based on your, um, I, one of the things that I do is uh, work with folks to, in recovery, to um, not so much shrink their character defects, which is the model that's dominant out there, but to build their strengths. And um, having a tool such as the criteria of indicators that you showed that people could create to capture a baseline and then measure, are we building our strengths accordingly, is in fact, would be a useful tool. And I'm wondering, are you aware of any such diagnostic tool for peer use? And, um, and what might you point me to if I'm in the business of helping people uh, internalize these practices that we're talking about? Any suggestions? Thank you. It's probably a bit beyond my expertise. I do, have ex I do think there are ways to, to change your brain, to exercise your brain. And I actually made an app for iPhone to, to, to that point. Uh, it's linked to them on my pages. But the, and the, the, uh, well, generally I'm focusing on the mental health part. And then it's the question is, very, it's, well, on, it's very simple to state that, that what you should do is to, you should exercise the capacity to turn off bad feelings. This is kind of what they do in cognitive therapy. They do the same there in treating with you know, like for phobies, etc. And you could also, ex of course, exercise the capacity to turn on the positive feelings. But for most people, the struggle is to get out of the depression and anxiety and, uh, and for some chronic pain. And that, that, that can be exercised. It's just so much more difficult to find good exercise routines applying to the these functions or apps in the brain compared to finding ways to exercise your muscles. But I, I hope eventually we will get better at, uh, at finding these exercise routines. And there are, mm. like there are experiments today where they use brain scans to, to allow for neurofeedback or let's say depression or anxiety. And then have people using this neurofeedback to exercise with and just trying to increase the signal for whatever neurofeedback they get. And that is promising. It's not really practical for large scale use, but the, so what we do have of exercise is tend to be to use like words and sentences and trying to make your mind tune into certain aspects like saying nothing, nothing matters, nothing is important and so on. Fantastic, thank you. Can I ask one more question before? Uh, uh, you, you mentioned three, the three anxiety, the, those three categories for, if you will, um, uh, that, that were hyperactive and thus problematic. What was the evidentiary basis of that categorization scheme? What, or what, do you think it's those three are the predominant or, or are there other models that you think are useful? I, I think they are definitely the predominant, but it's kind of a question of what you put into these words. I kind of like depression includes loneliness and you know, any sort of negative or no, any sort of oh, low mood feelings. Uh, so, so you can, and anxiety, of course, is anything from phobias to, to, to general anxiety and so on. So, but in a, if you, they, they do are, they do come out as in present vocabulary as what is the, uh, like 80, 90% of what is troubling people mentally. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Uh, excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we're, we're sort of out of time at this moment, so we'll send everyone a follow-up email with uh, Bjorn's email address if you have anything that you would like to follow up with. Um, I do want to remind everyone, if you look on the group chat, uh, I posted Bjorn's webpage, it's uh, grindy.wikispaces.com, which has, um, is that correct, all of the uh, links to your articles and books and, and so forth that are mentioned here. Um, Laura, did you have anything else to, to add? Um, so we will be having more webinars in 2018. Um, we'll, we'll put a, uh, the announce out for the next one in January, and then we'll, um, we're, we're lining people up. Um, this webinar has been recorded, so we'll be posting it up on YouTube. And um, really appreciate the, the, this is the longest <laughs> we've ever <laughs> gone this long. So um, it would, would, I think it would be really great if people have resources, if they could send them to Jill and myself, we will post those with the webinar. So we can even post, we can put links in to um, 
into the recording. We'll add those in. So Michael um, and Joseph, you would send those, send any references. Um, we can add that to this webinar. So thank you so much. And Bjorn, we're very honored and really, really appreciate the talk and giving so much of your time. <laughs> oh, I enjoyed it. Thank you for hosting me. Great. Thank you. Right. Have a lovely rest of the day, everybody. Have a good evening, Fjorn. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care.